Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about top 10 warning signs of diabetes a week before it happens, or signs and symptoms that you might experience a week before it happens, or a week before you get diabetes. Well, here's the thing. We're going to talk about some signs and symptoms, but the thing about the week before it happens, that's not really how it works. And the reason I picked that title anyway is that a lot of people believe that's how it works. It's like a point in time that you don't have it and then you have it. So we really want to understand these issues so that we don't fall prey to that kind of thinking. And much too often, the reason I bring this up is I hear all the time that people say things like, I was just diagnosed with type 2 diabetes as if it just started. And true, diagnosed is a point in time that before you didn't know and then you got diagnosed and now it's verified. But it doesn't mean that that's when it started, even though it makes people kind of think that way. And other people will say things like, I had blood work done last year and my doctor said I didn't have diabetes then. So there's a couple of things that we want to understand about the word diagnosed. First of all, that's a point in time, but it's not when it starts. And also we want to understand what's the problem with how they diagnose it. Secondly, we want to understand about having diabetes. Is that something that you can have really? And are there different types of diabetes that maybe you could have one kind and maybe not really have the other? Is it something you really have? And we're going to talk about that word so you really understand what I mean by that. So the diagnosis happens based on glucose. And if you have a fasting glucose, meaning you haven't eaten for about 12 hours or a few more hours, then if it's over 125 milligrams per deciliter, or if you're in millimoles, you divide that by 18, or if the A1C, which is a long-term, three to four month average of your glucose, if that is over 6.5, then you are classified as a diabetic. And here's what we need to understand about these numbers, that the range, it's an infinite number of points. You can be anywhere on this point, but they have picked specific points. So at 5.7, they call you pre-diabetic. And anything below that is okay, even though the middle of that range, like a 5.0 or a 5.1, is not at all the same as a 5.7. But once you get to 5.7, now they call you pre-diabetic and they say you probably should make some changes. Don't worry about it too much, but this isn't looking really great. So you need to eat better. And what do they tell you to eat? Just, they tell you to eat low fat. They tell you to eat plenty of grains and carbohydrates and starches, as well as lots of fruits and vegetables. And the only thing there that is okay to eat a lot of if you want to avoid getting worse is lots of vegetables and they should be the non-starchy kind primarily. And they also of course tell you to eat lots of low-fat dairy. And what happens if you continue eating according to their recommendations is that will actually promote insulin resistance. If you already have the tendency then a high carbohydrate diet will promote insulin resistance and then five years later you're very likely to be at 6.5. And for those people then who said last year they didn't have diabetes, well they might have been at 6.4. So they were very very far progressed along this line. So in the context of the signs and symptoms that you might get a week before, it doesn't work like that. Even though the diagnosis seemed like a point in time, it is a very, very long process that we need to understand. So the first classic sign of diabetes is increased thirst. And increased thirst happens because your body wants more water. And why would it want more water? That's because of sign number two that you are 
peeing a lot, you're urinating out, so you're losing water, and therefore, number one is your body wants to replenish that water. So obviously they go together. And the word diabetes is Greek. It means siphon or flow through. So the water that you're drinking is just flowing through you. You're not keeping as much and that's why you're peeing a lot and you get thirsty. And one of the reasons is that the glucose reaches a threshold that when your glucose gets really, really high above 180, and it could go much higher, it could reach three, four, five, 600, but above 180, your kidneys are not able to reabsorb it. So when the kidneys filter out water, it takes with it a lot of things that are dissolved, like sodium and potassium and glucose. And some of those things, it recovers a percentage, like a fraction, but glucose, it's supposed to recover, to reabsorb 100% on normal levels. But if your glucose goes up, then there's a threshold at 180, the kidneys doesn't want to keep everything. So it starts spilling. And there's two reasons. First, because there's too much to reabsorb. Secondly, because this is kind of a safety valve that really high blood glucose creates all kinds of health problems. It's really, really bad for the brain. It creates inflammation. It causes swelling. It interferes with a lot of different things. So the body doesn't want it too high, and therefore this becomes a safety valve. Over 180, things start spilling out. And when you spill sugar, you also spill water, and that's where you're losing water and you get thirsty. And this is a classic sign in type 1 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, then this really shouldn't happen because in type 2, the blood sugar rises much slower over decades. And therefore, it's only in very mismanaged and very late stages of type 2 diabetes that you would have blood glucose over that level. But yes, absolutely, it can happen. Uh, even though type 1, it's more of a classic sign because type 1 can develop much faster. But can it happen in a week? Let's talk about these time frames a little bit more and understand signs and symptoms. So a sign is something someone else can observe, like a doctor can measure or, or check something on you. That's a sign. A symptom is something that you experience. So they're kind of similar, but it, one is objective and one is subjective. Now, signs and symptoms are the last thing to show. That there's a disease process that goes on for a long, long time in many cases before you have any signs and symptoms. And these are physiological changes that the way your body operates, the pathways and the piping, it changes and we also want to understand the difference between disease and dis-ease. That in holistic health, we often make a distinction because in medical terms, they like to talk about disease and they think about things that are broken and things that are infected. Like we get an infection, we have a disease or where body parts break and don't function and don't do their job anymore. But dis-ease is the lack of ease, the lack of balance, the lack of equilibrium and homeostasis and proper function. So ease is when we're in harmony and disease when we're leaving that harmony. So it's not as black and white as disease, it's more of a grayscale. And historically, I believe that we suffered a lot more from disease, things that were more black and white. We had infections, we died from pneumonia and diphtheria and infections and plague and starvation. Whereas today, we die more from long-term imbalances. That most of the metabolic syndromes, most of the degeneration is more of a dis-ease, actually. Another word for that is an adaptation. That when our environment changes, your body adapts to it. And that is always a good thing. The body does that 
for reason, but if we keep pushing the body in certain ways long enough, then those adaptations might seem like they're a bad thing. So let me give you some examples here. That if you live at high altitude, your body will adapt. If you live really high, like 10, 15,000 feet, then the air is much thinner. There is less oxygen in the air, but your body needs oxygen. So the body needs to compensate. It needs to adapt. So the kidneys sense that there's less oxygen in the blood coming through. And then it makes a hormone called EPO or erythropoietin. Don't worry about the name. The kidney does something so that this hormone can stimulate the production of more red blood cells. With more red blood cells, you can absorb more, a greater percentage of the oxygen in the air when there is less oxygen in the air. So your body adapts and you can function even though you live in a place where there is less oxygen available. Brilliant! Exercise is another form of adaptation that if you put your body through work, if you put tension on your muscles, for example, if you're a bodybuilder, then the body says, hey, this was really painful. I'd better do something to compensate. If he's going to do this again tomorrow, I'm going to be better prepared. So let me build bigger muscles. All right. So there's a disease called polycythemia meaning we have too many blood cells. And that's where we have too many blood cells for the wrong reasons. But if we have more blood cells because of altitude, then that's a proper adaptation. And virtually all adaptations are proper. So we never go to a bodybuilder and say, hey, there must be something wrong with you. You look all swollen. No, those muscles are there because they're compensating, they're adapting to the increased workload. But here's the thing, diabetes is also an adaptation. So here is a cell and the cell performs work. It's the metabolic machinery. It uses fuel, it has enzymes and it makes energy out of that. Now over here we have a blood vessel. So when you eat food, you chew it, you digest it, you have enzymes in your digestive tract to break down the food. But this food can't do anything for you until it gets into the cell. And that's the role of insulin. So as we eat food, the blood sugar goes up and then insulin rises to bring that glucose into the cell. And now that cell can perform work and it's very happy. Then we eat again and the process continues. Now, if we do this the way we have done it for as long as humans have been around for eons, then we've eaten a certain way and this has balanced itself out. But in the last 50 years, we've started eating more frequently. We've added something called sugar in mass. It's not something we have once in a while, it's one of the big food groups, so to speak, unfortunately. So we eat sugar, we eat grains, we eat processed grains, we eat processed foods, and we start eating more snacks and we start having sugary drinks. Now what happens is that blood sugar rises many, 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 many times a day. We might eat three meals and have three snacks, but then we keep chewing on something in between too. So a lot of people, will have blood sugar spikes 20 times a day. And now we have insulin spikes 20 times a day. So now it's like we come knocking on the door of this cell 20 times a day and eventually the cell says, hey, you know, I just need stuff a couple of times a day, not 20. So it starts resisting insulin and that's insulin resistant. That's an adaptation. When we put too much stuff in, when we put more in, that it can reasonably use, then it's going to develop a resistance. So now it blocks the action of insulin. Insulin doesn't work the same, so the body has to make more. And now we're in a vicious cycle where insulin gets even higher, it keeps knocking even harder, the cell starts resisting even more. That is an adaptation.
So now with that in mind, let's compare type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And type 1 is not an adaptation. At type 1, in a sense, is something you, you can get it if you're unfortunate with circumstances that you might be stressed, you might have a genetic predisposition, you might get an infection, that there are certain conditions that when they combine in an unfortunate way, now you develop an autoimmune attack. And no one knows exactly why this happens, but they know some of these factors that are probably involved. And once you get it, and this autoimmune attack has destroyed, has actually broken down, had chewed up the cells that make insulin, now there are no cells, so now you have it. You have a condition. If you remember, I started out saying that there's a type of diabetes you can have and another one that you can't really have. Even though we talk about having type 2 diabetes, that's not really how we want to think about it. So type 1, unfortunately, you can get it and you can have it. Type 2 is a totally different animal. It is an adaptation, just like we talked about over here. When we do that process, when we push that process too far, the cell adapts, it becomes insulin resistance. So it's something that we develop. And if we truly understand that it is an adaptation, that is something the body does in response to something, that, and we develop it, we also can understand that if we want to keep our type 2 diabetes, we have to maintain it. And I'm saying that sort of jokingly because, of course, nobody wants to maintain their diabetes. Uh, but still, if you stop maintaining it, it will go away. Unfortunately, it's very, very simple. It's not all that easy, mostly because of habits, mostly because of bad information. We're told to eat low fat and high carb and that sugar in moderation is okay, which it's not for people with type 2 diabetes. Once you have developed this adaptation, then you need to back off much, much more than someone who is just trying to maintain a healthy level. So there are lifestyle issues. We're told to eat the wrong things. We have habits, we have cravings. But the fact of the matter is that if you stop maintaining it, then it will go away. Sign number three is unwanted weight loss. And this would be despite eating a lot. So this could be someone who has never had a weight issue. This could be someone who all of a sudden finds that they may not only be having more thirst and going to the bathroom more often, but they're also getting hungry and they're still losing weight. And this is called starvation in the midst of plenty that there's lots of food, you're eating lots of food, but it's not getting into where it needs to be. And it goes back to the issue we just talked about, but it's the reverse. So now, if there's no insulin, then there's no glucose in the cell. That all the glucose is in the bloodstream, but we can't make insulin anymore, so the glucose can't get into the cell, and therefore, we're still starving. And this would only happen with type 1 diabetes. Type 2 is never going to have this issue. There's no exact numbers, but we do want to keep in mind that with children, if they're very young and they get an infection that leads to an autoimmune attack on the pancreas, this could possibly happen in several weeks or, or a few months. So it's a pretty quick process. If this happens to adults, it usually is a much slower process. If you develop type 1 diabetes as an adult, it probably takes many, many months or a few years to kind of get that, that process completed. Sign number four is ketones in the urine. And ketones are a fuel for the body. It's an alternative fuel. It's a byproduct of fat burning. So, a lot of people who go on keto, they think of this as a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing if you have no glucose available. So again, when we say available, it doesn't mean you don't have glucose in your body, but if all the glucose is in the bloodstream and you don't have any insulin, it can't get into the cell. 
So therefore the cell is still starving and it needs fuel. So it's burning fat and it's making ketones. And we want to compare the levels though and understand the difference because very often they talk about ketoacidosis, which is a really bad thing, which is why they're mentioning here as a sign of, of diabetes. And this would be levels of ketones of 15 to 20 millimoles per liter. And in type 2 diabetes, you would basically not have any. You would have zero. So when we compare type 1 and type 2, very often they're called just diabetes as if they were the same thing, when in fact they should have two completely different names because they're opposites. They're polar opposites. When we look at glucose, they're both going to be high, but typically type 1 tends to develop faster or get out of control faster when we don't know about it. Uh, so type 1 might be even higher. Insulin is where the difference is, that a type 1 would have zero insulin and the type 2 diabetes would be too high. And then oftentimes, like I said, with ketogenic diets, what happens then? Well, if we start a ketogenic diet as a type 1 diabetic, when we already have high ketones, there will be no change because when the cell is starving, when you're not using any glucose, you are in a ketogenic state. That's why the ketones are so high. So going on a keto diet, diet is not recommended, but it really is no different than what you're already experiencing. If you're a type 2 diabetic and you were to go on keto, then you still have plenty of insulin and you would develop ketones, but you probably develop a little bit lower levels of ketone than the average healthy person because your body is still resisting burning fat. So it's harder to get those ketones going. So you might be like a 0.5 to a 1.5, maybe 2.0 if you're really strict and you do some exercise on top of that. If you do some fasting, again, the type 1 diabetic, there is no change because the body is starving you're already in a fasting state even if you're eating a bunch of stuff. So there's really no difference between eating and fasting for that person. And then if you are fasting as a type 2 diabetic, now if you go 36, 48 hours, 3 days, 4 days, now you can develop higher levels of ketones even though it probably will take a little longer to get them going than an insulin sensitive person. So now you might be at 1.5, maybe up to six millimoles or so. So when they talk about ketoacidosis, they're talking about a type one diabetic with zero insulin and extremely high levels of ketones. And this is life-threatening. You can die from this. This makes your blood very acidic and you need to head to the emergency room immediately. But if you're fasting, if you develop some ketones while you still have insulin, then it is not a problem. Your body is just adapting to that temporary circumstance and it's doing what it's supposed to do. So let me just compare a few more things between type 1 and type 2 so we understand these mechanisms and how these signs and symptoms apply. Type 1, first of all, is much, much less common, fortunately, because you can't really do that much with it. You can maintain it better or worse. You can manage it better, but you can't typically not do anything to reverse it, uh, especially not in the late stages. About 5% of cases, 5% of diabetics are a type 1. It's an autoimmune condition where the beta cells that make insulin in the pancreas, they get destroyed. When you don't have them, you can't make insulin. And these people will typically experience weight loss. Like I said, if you eat stuff but it can't get into the cell, you're still starving. Type 2 diabetes is much more common. That's 95% of the cases. It's a pure adaptation. It's not a disease. It's not something you have, it's something you developed, and if you stop doing it, it will go away. And it takes decades to develop, whereas this could happen not super fast typically as an adult, but uh, much, much faster than 
the type 2. And also it's associated with weight gain, which is the opposite of type 1. You can't really be a type 2 diabetic and lose weight without reversing that condition. Number five is blurry vision. So really high glucose levels cause swelling. Anything that has particles, any particle in the body like sodium and glucose are going to hold water by osmosis. So if we have super high glucose, it's going to seep into the surrounding tissues and it's going to hold water and cause swelling. And that's not a great thing because it reduces circulation. It reduces oxygen delivery. And in the eyes and in the kidneys, by the way, we have micro vessels. We have tiny, tiny blood vessels, very, very oxygen dependent. We have a lot of blood supply because those tissues are so active. They need a lot of blood, a lot of oxygen. But if we interfere with the circulation through this swelling, now those tissues don't get the proper blood supply. And the retina is one of those tissues and you can have compromised vision. And number six, is poor wound healing, that diabetics will get a little cut or they'll get some scratch on the foot and it just seems like it will never heal. And this goes back to what we're just talking about with the high blood sugar causing swelling because the swelling also affects nerves. Nerves also need blood supply and oxygen. So with the swelling, we can interfere with that delivery and now the nerves don't function and we need the nerve signals to heal the tissue. There's certain information being transmitted that way. And sugar also favors pathogens. So if you get an infection in a wound or if there's bacteria or fungus or something, having high sugar is going to keep those pathogens thriving, which can also keep those wounds infected and interfere with that healing. So all the signs and symptoms that we've talked about so far, they are pretty much late signs and symptoms. They'll develop in type 1 diabetes when you already have it, or they'll develop in a type 2 that is far gone and mismanaged. So in that sense, they're not really all that useful to help you do something about it. Uh, if it's type 2, you can still do something, but when it's really far gone, it's more difficult and more time consuming to reverse it. So let's talk about some things that still they're not going to happen a week before, but they'll be more useful in understanding what's actually going on with the things that you can do something about. Fatigue is one of those. And with type 1 diabetes, it's kind of obvious why this could happen. If you have no insulin present, then there is no fuel reaching the cells so the cells can't make energy. They're cutting way, way, way back on their energy production because all they can burn is the existing fat stores that they have. And as you get thinner, then there's less available. And fatigue is very common with that. Now with type 2 diabetes, even though it's the opposite in many ways, like it has too much insulin as opposed to no insulin, you can still have a lack of fuel. And here's why. Insulin is a storage hormone. Whenever you eat something, insulin rises to put to process that food, that energy, and put it either use some of it or put it into storage. And then the idea is for insulin to drop. And then when insulin drops, you can use some of that stored energy in between meals. But if you become insulin resistant, now, insulin goes higher and higher and higher, so it doesn't drop between meals. And that high insulin level keep the tendency of storing, keeps the tendency of not using. It prevents the usage of stored fuel. And therefore, when insulin is high between meals, you're basically starving again. And that's why the body tells you to eat food all the time when you're insulin resistant. And of course, the more food you eat, the more you make the problem worse. And one other factor is that the brain can only use glucose for fuel when your glucose is high and your insulin is high. 
During those circumstances, you make no ketones, which is the alternative fuel. So if you get on a ketogenic diet and your blood sugar drops, if you don't eat any carbs, now the brain gets ketones as a possible fuel. But if you keep eating carbs, so carbs are available, your blood sugar is high, insulin is high, your brain can only use glucose. And the brain can also get insulin resistant. So now when insulin is high, now the brain really doesn't have enough glucose between meals. And as a result, of course, you can experience fatigue. One more reason is that glucose gets converted to fat. When your cells are insulin resistant, your glucose is high, the glucose has no place to go. Even though insulin is high and trying to push that glucose into the cell, the cells are still resisting. So one more way to deal with that high glucose is to turn it into something else. And insulin is super high. Insulin promotes the conversion of glucose into fat, into triglycerides. And that is also a process that costs some energy. It uses up some energy that can rob you of some other resources. And for this reason, a lot of people with insulin resistance will experience fatigue, especially after a meal, when the body, when the glucose is high and the body is trying to convert it into fat. And number eight is belly fat. If you have a big belly, then probably you are insulin resistant. Belly fat typically is insulin resistance and insulin resistance is the same thing as type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is nothing more than a far progressed version of insulin resistance. When we let insulin resistance go far enough, that's an adaptation that is type 2 diabetes. It doesn't necessarily work the other way around because you do have some skinny people who are diabetics but who do not have belly fat. The vast majority of those people though, if you look carefully, they might be super skinny but they'll have a little pouch right around the, the midsection, kind of high on the midsection around the liver, indicating that yes, their liver is infiltrated with fat, their liver is insulin resistance, even though they're not overweight enough to actually look like they have a big belly. Number nine is hypertension or high blood pressure. And the mechanism here is that insulin increases, insulin promotes sodium reabsorption. So sodium and water always follow each other. So as the body filters fluid through the kidneys, sodium follows. And if we reabsorb more sodium with high insulin levels, we're also going to reabsorb. We're going to tend to keep more water in the body. And sodium is the primary extracellular electrolyte, meaning we have certain things inside a cell and some things outside the cell. And outside the cell, that's where the blood is. So when we measure sodium, we're measuring basically in the blood. Sodium is high in the blood and very low in the cell. So when we keep the sodium reabsorbed, that means our blood volume is going to be higher and therefore the blood pressure is going to be higher. And that's often one of the first things that people will notice when they go on a low carb and or intermittent fasting diet and lifestyle is that even before they may even lose weight or see any huge results, they'll notice their blood pressure drops because their insulin drops. But the best way to not ever get diabetes is to understand where it starts. So I'm going to show you what they typically do versus what I would suggest that you do. So if we start at a point in time when we still have balance and we measure our glucose and then we come back later and we track it every year, every few years, and then five years out we measure again and we say, hey, great, that hasn't changed, looks perfect. We go another few years and we measure again and we see that, all right, it might be like a couple of points higher, but it still looks really good. It's, it's in the normal range. And this is what they typically do. 
And then finally, we get a few more years out and now all of a sudden it's a few points higher. It's in the diabetic range. So let's call this 90s and 100 and 130. So this could be years and years and years before that glucose ever changes because it's super important for the body to keep the glucose controlled. It works tremendously hard at processing it very quickly to get it into that range after we eat. So what I would suggest instead, don't just measure glucose, don't just measure A1C, measure the thing that controls glucose. That's how we can see how hard the body is working. So as an example, we go back to where things were still in balance and then we look at this HOMA IR formula and we start off with a glucose of 90 and then we have an insulin of 4 which is a good level. Uh, ideal range is like 2 to 5 so if we do this we multiply the glucose by the insulin the level of glucose by how hard the body is working to control it we divide it by a constant called 405 and that's just to get a number around 1 which is a good level so in this case we have a HOMA IR homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance of 0.9 and if you measure in millimoles you just divide 405 by 18 and I think it's 22 and a half and then you divide by that so this would be a great place and if we understand that's a great place that's where we want to stay and anytime it becomes anything different we do something about it so let's go to the next step so now a few years later we measure again typically they just measure glucose but if we had measured insulin we would have seen that because we ate a bunch of sugar and cookies and muffins and waffles and potatoes and fried french fries and rice and so forth then it went up so now the glucose by itself looks almost the same it's like nothing happened but we measured the insulin and now that's double which means of course the home IR is going to be double and now would be a good time to do something about this and even though the glucose really hasn't changed this is where we want to start changing things if we understand what's going on and glucose and insulin are not the only things that you want to measure but they're two good components if you were to measure triglycerides like we talked about that excess glucose gets turned into triglycerides when insulin is higher then we would probably see that the triglycerides would follow suit pretty much closely to the to the insulin so then we wait another few years and again glucose hasn't changed very much but we go in and look at the numbers and we see that it's 101 which technically would be hey now you're pre-diabetic you're insulin resistant but it hasn't changed it doesn't look like it changed a whole lot until we look at the insulin levels and now we see that your HOMA IR is 4.0 in essence you're four times or over four times as insulin resistant as you want to be and yet the glucose has only changed by about 10 percent which is why glucose is not a great thing to look at and then of course we go a little further up in time and we see that now insulin has really gone haywire and even though this insulin is super super high that glucose is not quite under control so now glucose has gotten to 130 insulin has gotten at 25 which ironically insulin of 25 is at the end of the normal range even though it's eight times higher than you want it that's still considered normal which of course explains why they don't catch this until it's too late and with a HOMA IR of eight 
we are diabetic, we are eight times as insulin resistant as we want to be. And again, if we had measured triglycerides along with this, we would probably see the triglycerides go from maybe 60s to 120-ish to maybe 150, 200 to 3 to 400. And that's because fuel is glucose and fat. And if the cell resists one, it's going to resist the other. And if we understand this, we can start tracking these things much, much earlier and make changes or understand how to reverse the changes. So I made a blood work course where I explain all of this in much, much greater detail and not just the home IR, but basically every marker on the blood test that you could ever wish to understand. And that way you can really look and understand things at an early stage or like I said, wherever you are in the process, you can understand where you are and do something about it. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.